Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight, with Election Day a week away, meet the Republican candidates running for governor and hoping to unseat J.B. Pritzker this fall. I do not want to be a winner by cheating. Damning testimony on President Trump's efforts to overturn his election loss as the January 6th congressional hearings resume. We do have it in-house. Chicago area health centers prepare to vaccinate young kids for COVID-19. Our job is not just difficult, it's very dangerous. The police department unveils its new foot pursuit policy that leaders say helps protect suspects and officers. A new book takes a colorful look at pioneering icons of the arts in the LGBTQ community. And Paw Chicago turns 25. We sit down with the founder to talk about the future of saving furry friends. But first, some of today's top stories. Election workers and public officials testified today in the latest January 6th congressional hearing on the attack at the U.S. Capitol. The House Select Committee focused its fourth hearing on efforts by then-President Donald Trump and his campaign to overturn local election results in key states. Former Georgia election worker Arshay Moss was among those who testified. She and her grandmother received death threats after the Trump campaign claimed she had produced illegal votes for Biden. We'll have more on Moss's testimony and analysis on today's hearing coming up later in the program. Former state senator Tom Cullerton is sentenced to one year in prison after pleading guilty to embezzlement. He's the latest Illinois lawmaker to be incarcerated after being convicted of corruption. Cullerton represented the Illinois Senate's 23rd district until 2022. That's after serving as Villa Park president and trustee. The plea agreement requires Cullerton to repay nearly $250,000. Illinois police officials are warning motorists to keep their cool as they encounter angry drivers. State Police Director Brendan Kelly says in a statement, quote, As we head into summer, high temperatures can lead to hot tempers and people losing their cool, even the dangerous or deadly use of firearms. Getting ahead or getting even with another driver is not worth the risk of a deadly crash or violence. Keep calm and stay alive. There's been a total of 105 expressway shootings recorded so far this year. State police say approximately 35% of expressway shootings they've responded to through mid-June in the Chicago area were classified as road rage incidents. That's up from roughly 12% for all of 2021. Up next, Republican candidates hoping to unseat Governor J.B. Pritzker face off in our WTTW News Forum. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. Tens of millions have been spent and hardly a moment goes by without a campaign commercial on local commercial television. Six candidates are vying for the Republican nomination for governor to take on incumbent Democrat J.B. Pritzker. The campaign has been marked by a handful of billionaire supporters who have competing interests and are battling not only for the direction of the state, but of the Republican Party here itself. And joining us now in the order they'll appear on the ballot are Paul Schimpf, an attorney, Gary Rabine, founder and chairman of the Rabine Group, which provides services like paving and snow removal, and Max Solomon, also an attorney. Candidates Jesse Sullivan and Darren Bailey declined our invitation. Candidate Richard Irvin's campaign did not return numerous messages inviting him to join us this evening. But we do welcome all of you, and we are glad that you're here in person uh, with us. Uh, I want to start, and I'll just go left to right with the news of the day. Uh, we saw some compelling testimony in the January 6th hearing from Republican Arizona House Speaker uh, on his refusal to go along with the fake elector scheme on the pressure campaign that the Trump campaign uh, uh, applied on him. Uh, do you accept that uh, Biden legitimately won the 2020 election? Well, Joe Biden won the election. He is my president. We have the rule of law in this country. President Trump made his legal challenges in court and he lost. So Joe Biden is my president. Gary Rabine, a legitimate uh, win for Joe Biden 2020. Joe Biden's our president. Um, I, I don't really particularly think about the election now. It's, uh, it's gone and by and, and we look forward to what we're doing here in Illinois. 
Max Solomon, after testimony we've heard, is this uh, is clear that this was a legitimate win and these, these fraudulent uh, claims of a, a fraudulent election uh, do not measure up? Well, I disagree. Uh, I don't think Joe Biden won. He's the president. Now, I'm not going to deny that. He's the president of the United States, but I don't think it, he won. What's the, what's the evidence that convinces you? That well, what's the evidence that he did? Uh, we, had, we have a lot of questions. Right? We have the Republican Attorney General, Bill Barr, saying these claims of fraud didn't measure up. You have the losses in court. You have some of the testimony you've heard from Republicans. It's, it doesn't change your mind? Well, but no, it doesn't. By the, by the same token, we have a lot of uh, testimony from Pennsylvania, even Georgia, of people saying hands-on experience watching things happen that we have no answers to. All right. There's a lot of questions. I want to get to some of the other news of the day. The Senate uh, recently uh, released specifics of a bipartisan gun deal. It would include uh, funding for red flag laws. There are red flag laws in Illinois. Uh, it would close the boyfriend uh, loophole for those convicted of domestic violence and then enhance background checks uh, for those aged 18 to 21. So before we get to Illinois' gun laws, uh, very quickly, uh, should Congress pass this package? No, we need to enforce the laws that we have right now. Uh, more restrictions on law-abiding citizens, Second Amendment rights, are not going to make our kids safer. What we need to do is we need to make sure that we have armed trained veterans present in schools to provide safety. Enforcing the laws that we have is what we need to do, and we need to also pay more attention to mental health. We do have a mental health crisis in this country. That's something that we need to be spending more time and attention on. But I'm not in favor of new gun control legislation. And as a state senator, I voted against uh, gun control legislation in the Illinois General Assembly. All right, uh, Ms. Ray, Ben. again, we'll get to the Illinois laws, but uh, quickly, should the Senate and House pass this uh, national package? So in my opinion, we need, we need to be able to do something. We get a bad state's attorney as we do with Kim Fox. I mean, she's not enforcing the laws. We're not holding people accountable. We hope people will be able to account for the smallest, crim the s smallest crimes and the biggest will be in better shape. Mr. Solomon, uh, this look, national uh, bipartisan package? Look, Paris, I don't believe in knee-jerk uh, approach to passing legislation. Uh, we don't wait for things to happen and then we hurry up and do something about it. I think uh, gun laws or gun uh, issues uh, are things that we need to take a, a very close look at and not rush into legislation. All right, well, let's take a close look at uh, Illinois' uh, gun laws. So I think all of you have proposed changes to the firearm owner's identification card, also known as the FOID card in uh, Illinois. So uh, uh, I'll, start, well, I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Rabine, this time. Uh, w how should that program change? Yeah, so most places, I think there's also just one other state, maybe two other states that have something like a FOID card. Um, you know, nowadays we, we, can, we can do background checks with licenses. We don't need that, the layer, in my opinion, of a FOID card. Mr. Solomon, uh, what change did you make to the void card? Get rid of it. Uh, get rid of it. It's an, encumber an encumbrance on the Second Amendment. I believe in the Second Amendment, and I believe that uh, every good guy who wants to have a gun should be able to have a gun uh, without any restriction or regulation uh, in excess of what the federal government already provides. Mr. Shimp, what about that? Well, one of the reasons that I'm the best candidate for Illinois governor on the Republican side is I have a voting record. People don't have to guess where I stand on the issues. And when I was a state senator, I co-sponsored legislation to abolish the FOID card. The FOID process is broken. The amount of time it takes to get FOID cards just is unacceptable. It's not doing anything to make us safer. We just, you know, the FOID is a failed experiment that needs to end. All right, uh, you brought up uh, local prosecutors like Kim Fox. Uh, the uh, state uh, and the governor signed the Safety Act, which right. starting in January will mean uh, the end of cash bail in Illinois, among other provisions in this uh, act. Uh, would you, if you were governor, uh, keep the Safety Act as law? And if not, how would you work with uh, Democrats to change it? Oh, get rid of the Safety Act. The Safety Act is not safe at all. The, uh, when, we get, when we get rid of, hopefully, by January, uh, something happens. Uh, uh, no cash bail uh, was a mistake in, in that package, and I'll get rid of it. And um, to the second question, um, I'm hoping that uh, as governor, we'll be able to get back on the table with the Democrats. But here's what I've always said about the Democrats. They're not going to work with a Republican governor. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, we're just going to go in there. We're going to be happy together. It's not going to happen. But here's what I intend to do. I'm going to give them an incentive to do it, and I'm going to give them motivation to do it. 118 rep seats, 59 state senators. We're going to compete in every one of those seats. All right, so you, you would use some political muscle to, Absolutely. to, to challenge some of those seats. Uh, Mr. Schimpf, uh, the Safety Act, and we should mention that it would uh, it would end cash bail but keep violent alleged offenders 
in jail without bail, uh, what would you do with the Safety Act? Well, the most important thing to remember about the Safety Act is that it was passed with law enforcement being kept in the dark. They were deliberately excluded from the drafting process of that bill. And when the bill was passed in the Illinois Senate at 4 a.m. in the morning, I was there, I voted no. But nobody knew what was in that bill when it was passed. It wasn't, that's the worst example of a corrupt legislative process. We do need to make changes to it, and the changes that we need to make are bringing the law enforcement community to the table and sitting down and listening to them for a change. And when we have the law enforcement community involved, I do believe the, uh, the Democrats will make changes. All right, Mr. Rabin, I'm assuming you too want to change that law. How, and assuming you have uh, uh, Democratic majorities in the General Assembly, how would you approach changing so that law? HB 3653 is a disaster. And, and going forward in 2023, you, you mentioned the, the, this, this cash bail thing, right? But on top of that, we also aren't going to arrest people for trespassing. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, to think about not arresting people that trespassing, giving them a ticket if they're trespassing, not arresting them, letting them stay on the property with a ticket. It's ridiculous. So it has to go. It has, it's nothing to do with safety. It's an it's, it's a assault against our police officers and our, and our communities. And what, how would you work with, uh, assuming you have Democratic majority yeah. still, how would, how would you get some of them I mean, on board? You have to bring police to the table to, to, te to be te testimony to the, to the disaster of this, this bill. Um, and, and, and you need to inspire inspire these people to understand the danger we're creating in our communities. All right, let's uh, move to other issues uh, on voters' minds. Gas prices, inflation, the economy. Uh, the governor uh, has suspended, I'm sorry, frozen the gas tax <laughs> where it is. It's not going to go up uh, for six months. Uh, would you go a step further as governor and suspend all uh, state gas taxes for the time being to provide relief to people, even though infrastructure projects do depend on that money. Well, you have to realize that infrastructure projects have been getting record revenue coming in, and they have been getting the funding. We are at an unprecedented time in our history. Inflation represents a threat to the, just the financial security of every single family in Illinois. Action is needed. One of the things that I have been proposing for a long time, even when I was a state senator, is I said, we need to stop the practice of charging sales tax on tax. That's a, that's a predatory practice where we charge tax on tax. That's something that I opposed back when I was a state senator. And that's part of our new start for Illinois policy agenda is getting rid of that predatory practice of charging tax on tax. Uh, Mr. Solomon, uh, what about the, uh, suspending the entire state gas tax for a while? Absolutely. Look, I'm not convinced and I'm not, uh, I'm not bought by Pritzker's uh, providing relief for a burden he created. One of the first actions when he became governor was he increased fees, he increased taxes. So now, uh, election time, he's giving up some, some relief. No, I'm not bought. Uh, here's the thing. We're going to get rid of all the taxes. We're going to get rid of it. And it, this is what I'm pr going to propose. Uh, all it, the gas taxes? or all Well, the ones, Priscus. I call them okay, Priscus okay. gas taxes. It's, what, 38 cents that he raised uh, when he became governor? Uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at why Pritzker and the Democrats are raising taxes in the first place. You mentioned infra infrastructure. Not only that, the pension crisis, we need to pay our debts. There's a lot of, Illinois is in debt. And why are we raising these taxes? Because they want to pay the debts, right? But we, I'm going to create an alternative to paying these taxes by reforming pension. CPR, constitutional pension reform, we need to go into that, fix the problem, and then we can get some real tax reliefs. All right, I'm, I'm going to pick up on that uh, subject of uh, pensions, but I, I want to get you, uh, Mr. Rabine, uh, yeah, so, the gas so, so Paris, about two cents a gallon is not going to make enough of a difference. The, the, the damage is done. Uh, we're the second highest gas tax in the country. That's not fair to our citizens. And, and this is a governor that, that's really backed the Green New Deal that Biden that Biden made to ruin our, our, our economy in the first place when he shut off the pipelines. This governor now is his own Green New Deal as, as we're shutting down our nuclear plants, our clean coal plants. Uh, we're, we're doing damage for, for that, that's going to cost us triple what we pay now in energy in, in, the, in, the, in the coming years, all on the bet that windmills and solar are the answer and, and something we're going to subsidize. We're going to subsidize uh, the, the, the highest cost energy in the country is what we'll end up with within five to ten years. So we, we've got, we've got a, a great governor who's going to retract that. All right, I want to move, move on to a political question here. Um, there's been a lot of polling out there that shows the three of you here in single digits. You've got a week left. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Schimpf. Uh, how do you make up that gap, uh, that perceived gap here between you and your opponents? Well, I would say it's perceived. I mean, the reality is after what we saw happen in the last presidential election where the polls were wildly 
off. Some of these national polls, state polls, were 15 points off. Anybody that is making voting decisions based on polls is really destroying their credibility. Uh, my support is very localized. You know, I don't have a billionaire benefactor, uh, so we're trying to really focus our efforts in the areas where we have infrastructure and good organizations. And if we get to 25 percent, we will win. And right now, the race is very fluid. Uh, the reality is you have these billionaire-backed candidates that have spent millions of dollars and have not been able to make the sale. The people of Illinois do not like what they're seeing from the billionaire-backed candidates. They want candidates that are going to be able to unite the Republican Party and defeat J.B. Pritzker because nothing changes in Illinois unless you defeat J.B. Pritzker, and you cannot defeat J.B. Pritzker unless you unify the Republican so, Party. So you speak of those uh, billionaire-backed candidates. So you have Ken Griffin, who has spent about $55 million uh, on uh, Richard Irvin, and, and then a slate of candidates for other offices. And then Dick Uline, who spent uh, uh, a few million dollars on Darren Bailey. So uh, there are, uh, J.P. Pritzker himself has Pritzker. spent and then, uh, money. And then, in and this. then you, have, you have California uh, donors spending millions on Jesse Sullivan, Jesse Sullivan. as well. Right. So. so Mr. Rabine, uh, what about you? How do you... How do you uh, turn the tide here in the last week? You've got yeah, seven so, days left to make the so case. So we've been pulling double digits in most things that we see, okay? But here, it, 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 ask Hillary Clinton about the polls, right? I mean, she was a winner all the way to the, the last day. It didn't happen so well for her. But either way, bottom line is this, as, 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 as we talk about, when you look at paying for polls, you can get the polls that you want. You get, you get the answers you want if you pay for the polls, and, and you, you can manipulate them in the way you want, in my opinion. I think that's going on. We're not paying for polls. I don't want polls. I don't, I don't believe we need them, and we're going to continue to fight hard. It's going to be, uh, it's, it, it's going to be a wave for me, and it, it's going to be Ray by time when I win. <laughs> Max Holloman, a, a wave for you? Hey, look, I'm the smallest guy in the race. Uh, <laughs> I've never motivated or discouraged by polls, never, uh, neither by finances. When you have uh, solutions to problems that Illinois face, all you need to do is step up and speak about them, and that's what I'm doing. I believe that people are going to follow the message, and in the polls, I see that almost 30% are undecided. And really, that's all you need for any one of us to clinch it. So I believe strongly that our message is going to continue going out, and I believe that people are going to hear our message. And it's been very encouraging. People who've heard us speak, who've heard us uh, approach the, the solutions that we are proposing uh, to, the sol to the problems of Illinois have come our way. And I believe we're going to pull this off, God willing. All right, let's uh, get back to some economic issues. Uh, Mr. Rabin, I'm sure you saw that uh, Illinois has lost two Fortune 500 companies in the last few weeks, Caterpillar uh, and Boeing, well, Boeing a few months ago. Although Although announcement today that Kellogg's is going to move its headquarters to Chicago, uh, what would you do as governor to keep these businesses and attract more businesses? Yeah, so when I win, CAT is back. I say this because I'm very passionate about Caterpillar and all businesses that are here. Caterpillar is equipment that's dear to my heart. Uh, my, my business has been built in, in the paving industry. The best equipment in the world is Caterpillar equipment. And we're going to get them back. And, and, and we, we got to quit with the subsidies. We got to quit thinking that we have to give steroids, inject steroids in companies to get them here. Um, you know, Boeing came here with a bunch of bun bunch of uh, uh, perks. They left when they ran out, and now they're they, they're going for the next perks, right? And you can understand that if you don't have an, a, a, if you don't have regul a regulatory environment that keeps them here, tax environment that keeps them here, they're gone once that, those things run out. So I want our regulatory environment to be competitive with the rest of the country. I want our taxes, our property tax, to be competitive with the rest of the country. Our property tax are, are, are three to four percent of the value. Where I live, they're four percent. Some of my friends pay five percent on, on the value of their property. One percent is the average in the country. So a $200,000 house pays $2,000 in the average state. We're paying six to $10,000. This is sickening. It's highway robbery. So, so how do you do, do you do that with caps, passing caps at the state level on local it's, property? It's been done in Indiana. It's been done in Tennessee. It's been done in California. Even crazy California went to a 1% cap years ago, right? And since then, their property values have skyrocketed and continue to. When Indiana did this, they were stagnant. Their property values doubled in a short period of time. They still go up, while our properties over the last 15 years have been stagnant. So, you know, lower values today in most homeowners than they had in 2008. That's, that's crazy. So we need, we, need to, we need more taxpayers, not more taxes. We need less regulations on small business so small businesses feel great. They're not being smothered. And the big business like Caterpillar will stay when we do that. All right. Uh, I want another uh, fiscal issue here, uh, Mr. Schimpf. Uh, Mr. Solomon brought up uh, a constitutional amendment uh, to get rid of the Pension Protection Clause. We know that liabilities, unfunded liabilities, hovered around $130 billion. It's been a problem for probably decades now. Uh, do you support uh, a constitutional amendment uh, to reduce... Uh, 
future uh, pension benefits? No, I don't want to take the pension clause out of the Illinois Constitution because the state needs to keep its pension promises. As a state senator, I was on the pensions working group, and the two drivers of our pension shortfall, which is unsustainable, we have to do something about it, it's going to take leadership, but the two drivers are the fact that the state stole from the pension funds, did not make the pension payments that it was supposed to make, and then also the fact that the compound cost of living adjustments are so are so high that doubles the uh, you know that can double pension amounts very quickly. Well, we know that the state can't change that now unless there's a constitutional. But amendment. what the state has to do, though, the state is going to have to make some tough decisions, and the state is going to have to basically pay back the money that it stole from the pension funds. The reality is there is no silver bullet, there is no magic bean solution. We have been digging this pension hole for three decades now, and it's going to take at least a decade to get us back to where we should be. Now, what I reject is when people say that we can't do it with tough decisions. There have been two of the past four years where we have had record revenue coming into the state of Illinois. What have we done? Instead of paying back the money we stole from the pension funds, we have increased spending across the board. Right. I'm, i, I got to move on to the contentious issue uh, of abortion. L very likely, obviously, that Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned unless something happens uh, that would change that draft uh, ruling. We know that Illinois uh, abortion would stay legal, and the governor signed the pr uh, repeal of the Parental Notification Act. Once again, assuming you're going to have to work with Democrats uh, who have majorities, what would you do about abortion? Get rid of it. Uh, it is my prayer, uh, Paris. I am uncompromisingly and unapologetically pro-life. As a matter of fact, I go one step um, high, uh, more. I am so pro-life, I believe that life actually starts when God says it starts, not at conception. Regardless of how conceived, every life has purpose. So I pray that Roe v. Wade be uh, overturned, and my uh, uh, role in that as governor would be to make sure that every dollar, no, not a single dollar, not a single cent, goes towards funding of abortion in the state of Illinois, and abortion will be illegal in the state of Illinois. All right, Mr. Raybine, uh, abortion in, in Illinois, I'm working with probable uh, Democratic majorities in the state house? Yeah, I mean, so Pritzker's uh, goal to be the, the abortion oasis is happening. We, 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 need to, we need to beat him for this purpose, uh, exclusively in my opinion. When, we, when, we, when our state is a state where people come for free abortions and, and, and human traffickers come for, for those abortions without no parent parental notification, we got major problems here. And, w and we need to change this. So this 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 non this uh, uh, non notification thing we did recently is, is is sickening for a 12, 13, 14 year old girl to be pregnant and her parents not know about it and, and to go get an abortion without without them as as part of her team to make these decisions is is evil. All right. To to for you know after birth abortions is is crazy, sickening. Uh, late term abortions, right? And and then for us as all of us to pay for abortions as, 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 with HB 40 is ridiculous and it's got to go. All right, uh, Mr. Schimpf, we only have a few seconds left, but I want to get you in here. Well, right now in Illinois, you can have a preborn child can be aborted up to the moment of live birth for any reason, no matter how heinous, like gender selection, and it's paid for by taxpayer dollars. When I am governor, I will sign any legislation that moves us away from that extreme and closer to the mainstream. All right, uh, we are out of time. We do appreciate the three of you being here today. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Gary Rabine, Max Solomon, and Paul Schimpf. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Paris. Thank you, Paris. And we're back with more Chicago tonight in just a moment, so please stay with us. story of Latinos in America is that of entrepreneurship. About 5 million Latino-owned businesses currently exist in the U.S. Predominantly Latino communities often bear the environmental burden of heavy industry. Residents of those communities say they have a hard time making their concerns hurt. A Chicago-based photographer has a personal understanding of immigration and he has spent years documenting small businesses. The forces of gentrification can make people being priced out of their neighborhoods feel powerless. But the founders of Lolita's Bodega say residents have more power than they think.
Still to come on Chicago tonight, more damning testimony from the January 6 hearings on former President Trump's efforts to overturn the results of the presidential election. A new foot pursuit policy from the Chicago Police Department is unveiled today. We break down the changes and when they take effect. Children as young as six months can now get vaccinated for COVID-19. We talk with medical professionals who say they should. Paws Chicago has been preventing the deaths of thousands of homeless animals for 25 years. We chat with the founder for a look at the past and what the future holds. And a new book takes a colorful look at pioneering icons of the arts and culture in the LGBTQ community. But first, some more of today's top stories. As temperatures in the Chicago area hovered around 100 today, a revised measure could soon require landlords to offer residents a chance to escape the heat in an air conditioned space. City Council members are vowing to act quickly following the deaths of three Rogers Park women in a senior living facility during a mid-May heat wave. The measure would require all apartment complexes with more than 100 units and those designated for residents older than 55 that do not have air conditioning to cool and dehumidify all indoor common areas. It's designed to give residents a respite from their sweltering apartments. The revised measure is set for a final vote at tomorrow's city council meeting. And defying Mayor Lori Lightfoot, a key city council committee votes to roll back the law that hits drivers with a $35 ticket who speed past schools and parks. The policy change would raise the ticket threshold to 10 miles an hour over the speed limit from the current six. In a statement, Mayor Lightfoot says, quote, it is simply unconscionable that after losing 173 Chicagoans to speed related traffic fatalities in 2021, some aldermen are acting with so little regard for public safety. The final city council vote is scheduled for tomorrow. If passed, it'll leave about a $45 million hole in the city's budget. Amid ongoing inflation and high gas prices, businessman and mayoral candidate Willie Wilson says he's giving away another $2 million in gas and food to assist residents in Chicago and nearby suburbs. Other people who live in on the street have a problem just eating. They don't want to survive things of that nature. How can you build another business when um, the people are struggling here that need to eat like today but not tomorrow? Gas currently costs an average of $4.97 a gallon nationwide, according to AAA, while the average price in Illinois is $5.49 per gallon. Wilson says the grocery coupon giveaway will start June 28th, while the gas giveaway will be on July 9th. A list of locations for the giveaways is yet to be released. And now to Paris for the latest out of the Chicago Police Department. Paris. Brandis, more than 60 people were shot, 10 fatally, over the Juneteenth holiday weekend across Chicago. This as the Chicago Police Department unveils its new foot pursuit policy. Here's Police Superintendent David Brown speaking at a news conference earlier in the day. This policy, without question, hits the right note in balancing uh, officer safety, uh, our ability to capture offenders, but do it in a way that's constitutional. And WTDW News reporter Matt Masterson joins us now with more. Matt, first there was no real foot pursuit policy. Then there was a framework of one that got much maligned, so they went and made changes. What are the changes, and when will they take effect? So CPD officials today, they pointed to two main changes in this new policy. One was uh, additional supervisory oversight that's going to be in place once this takes effect. And the second is a new form that officers are going to have to fill out after they engage with any foot pursuit. And police are hoping that this is going to help uh, the department better track and analyze and keep the data on these foot pursuits going, which they've been um, criticized for in the past. It also defines when officers can and cannot engage in a foot pursuit, what the person needs to be doing um, before an officer can actually begin doing that. Um, and as for when it takes effect, while it was announced today, it isn't immediately clear when it's going to take effect. Police leaders said that all officers need to go under go training for this new policy before they can actually implement it. And they're hoping that can be done by the end of the summer. And remind us how the police department got to this point. Well, today, Police Superintendent Brown said that the department has been working on a new policy like this for years, but the CPD has really been under pressure for the last year plus, uh, going back to March of 2021, following the fatal shootings of 13-year-old Adam Toledo and 22-year-old uh, Anthony Alvarez, who were each killed by officers just days apart um, during foot pursuits last year. 
Um, since then, the CPD has had a temporary policy in place, but they missed uh, an imposed deadline to get this permanent policy in place last September, and they've still been working to it up until this point while they've been hounded by community activists and other leaders who have been really trying to get this in place. All right, we'll watch for these uh, changes to take effect. Matt Masterson, thank you so much. Thanks, Paris. And you can read Matt's stories and the updated foot pursuit policy and the deadly holiday weekend uh, by visiting our website, wttw.com slash news. And now to Brandis and the latest on the congressional investigation into attempts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Brandis. Paris, more witnesses testified before a select committee of Congress about the January 6th attacks on the U.S. Capitol. The fourth day of hearings today focused on the efforts of President Donald Trump and his campaign to pressure state officials in key states to overturn the election results. Here's Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers responding to questions about the Trump campaign's efforts to have him overturn the result of the election in Arizona. On more than one occasion throughout all this, that has been brought up, and it is a tenet of my faith that the Constitution is divinely inspired of my most basic foundational beliefs. And so for me to do that because somebody just asked me to is foreign to my very being. I, I, I will not do it. Joining us now with more in today's hearing is Jeff Mandel, lead counsel and president of Law Forward, a bipartisan nonprofit law firm that is suing to bring criminal charges against fake electors in Wisconsin. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Um, so today it sounded like we ha heard some powerful testimony. What were the key takeaways for you? Well, I think the key takeaways were really three. Uh, first, we heard today evidence that backs up what I think many of us had long suspected, which, this, which is that this fraudulent elector scheme really was a conspiracy that began in the White House and was coordinated at the highest national levels. Second, we got further confirmation of what we'd heard in earlier hearings, which is that repeatedly people very close to the president, as they looked at some of these ideas tied into the big lie and the fraudulent electors uh, scheme, said, this doesn't work. This is not legal. We should not do this. And the president simply over and over and over dismissed those voices and continued to rely on a smaller and smaller core of people who would tell him whatever he wanted to hear. And third, uh, we really did get a sense uh, that there are a, a number of honest, um, forthright, very conservative people um, in the United States, in Washington, in Arizona, and elsewhere who refuse to go along with this. Jeff, how, how effective do you think these hearings have been uh, in you know, laying out these efforts in a way that engages the American people? And do you think the American people are engaged? Well, I think that the what, what's really important is that the hearings are giving the American people information that they need and deserve. Everyone needs and deserves the opportunity to understand how their government works. And in this case, in an unprecedented way, how there was a real effort to create essentially a coup in this country and defeat for the first time in our history the peaceful transition of power and overwhelm the will of the voters. Um, I think that the, commission, the committee is doing an excellent job of breaking this down in ways that are uh, understandable, that are clear, that are compelling, where the primary messengers of fact are themselves conservatives and Republicans. And I think they're doing a great job. I very much hope that everyone is watching. So uh, Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, he was asked why he didn't just quit the job given the pressure that he was under and the threats uh, that he and his family faced. Uh, take a listen to what he said. And I think sometimes moments require you to stand up and, and just take the shots you're doing your job, and that's all we did. You know, we just followed the law and we followed the Constitution. And at the end of the day, President Trump came up short. Now, uh, Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers, uh, who we heard from earlier, and Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, they all testified that former President Trump was repeatedly told there was no evidence supporting his claims of fraud. Uh, what does this possibly mean uh, for the former president potentially being legally liable about what happened uh, on January 6th? 
Well, I'm not a prosecutor, but but it, it, it does seem with every single one of these hearings, we continue to hear evidence that a number of different people, politicians, uh, voting experts, lawyers, people in the states, people in Washington, continued to tell the president that his theories were baseless and wrong, and he continued to forge ahead. And given that one major element of, of, of criminal activity is knowledge that what you're doing is wrong, um, it seems that the committee is putting together quite a strong showing of, of that. And uh, we're, I'm very interested to see what happens. I mean, there are lots of audiences for these hearings, and one of them obviously is the American public. Another is clearly prosecutors at the state and local level, state and federal level. So as we mentioned when we just heard from Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger a second ago, um, but all of the witnesses that testified today, they spoke of the threats to themselves, their colleagues, and their families. Uh, one of them was former Georgia election worker Arshea Moss. She received death threats um, after the Trump campaign claimed that she had produced illegal votes for Biden. Um, she also talked about a frantic call that she received from her grandmother. Here she is. This Woman is my everything. I've never even heard her or seen her cry ever in my life. And um, she called me screaming at the top of her lungs like, Shay, Shay, oh my God, Shay, just freaking me out, saying that um, there were people at her home and they just started pushing their way through, claiming that they were coming in to make a citizen's arrest. They needed to find me and my mom. They knew we were there. Jeff, uh, how compelling do you think uh, that testimony was, both from Arshea Moss, but the committee also heard from her mother, who we saw sitting behind her in the red? I think it's incredibly compelling. It shows that there are real human stakes here. And, uh, you know, the, the big lie proponents not only were trying to overthrow the will of the voters, but one of the things that we're hearing in these in these hearings um, from the Capitol Police woman who spoke at the first hearing to, to, to Ms. Moss today, I mean, what we're hearing is how heedless they were of the consequences. They were willing not only to throw away the very idea of America and the fundamentals of our democracy, but they had no care at all for real human people who are going to be hurt in the process. It's absolutely chilling. Uh, now, one of the other fo areas of focus today was on efforts to get state officials to reject the true election results and send fake electors to D.C. Uh, Jeff, you're involved with a lawsuit relating to fake electors in Wisconsin. What did we learn about how that effort was coordinated from the very top? Well, that's really what we did learn. You know, here in Wisconsin, we know quite a bit about the details of the fraudulent electors, and Law Forward has brought this first in the nation lawsuit, the only one that's seeking accountability. We hope that there will be others in, in the other states, but right now, we're at the forefront of this. What we learned today is just confirmation that this really was started at the very top. And in fact, one of the president's lawyers, uh, Cleta Mitchell, said at the very beginning of the hearing today that they started planning this before election day and that within 48 hours of uh, election day before all the votes had been counted before we before a winner had been certified they were already at work on memos about how to do this how to carry out this scheme even though they knew that it, it really wasn't legal and every lawyer who we heard from today as they looked at it came to the conclusion that it wasn't legal. Not one, not two, but three separate high-level uh, Trump campaign and White House lawyers today uh, were, were so, seen on tape telling the committee that they recognized as they looked at this, it was completely unlawful and they wanted so nothing to do with it. Definitely some revelations today uh, and more to come as the hearings proceed, I'm sure. We'll have to leave it there. Jeff Mandel at Law Forward, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And now, Paris, we toss it back to you. Brandis, thank you. It was back in December of 2020 that the first people in Chicago, a group of five healthcare workers, got vaccinated for COVID-19. 18 months later, it is now available to the city's youngest residents. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with more. Amanda. Paris, it has been a long pandemic. Just ask Michelle Red, who owns Building Block Learning Academy in Englewood. It's very difficult to try to maintain cohorts within cohorts. Um, or to ask a two or three or four year old to wear a mask when they're simply just being a preschooler. And so 
we've had to come up with creative ways to still be able to teach cognition. Uh, we've come up with ways such as taking hula hoops and having them sit in the hula hoops. And they think it's very fun, but it really provides social distancing. She says some families, particularly those with children who until now have been too young to get vaccinated, have been nervous about coming back. She's hopeful they and their daycare providers will feel more comfortable as infants and toddlers are now eligible to get their shots. And doctors say it's important that they do. We're so fortunate that children aren't as vulnerable uh, as older individuals, uh, but we do know that they get uh, COVID, they get the infection, SARS-CoV-2, uh, they are able to spread it within a household. Dr. Daniel Johnson's pediatric infectious disease specialist at Comer Children's Hospital, also a leader with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and he says the impact on young children is similar to the impact of influenza, and pediatricians recommend babies and toddlers get flu shots, so same holds true with COVID. And while it is less common, tens of thousands of children under age five have been in the ICU with COVID want to take advantage of the opportunity to save a life. And that's really what we're talking about. Yes, uh, we're talking about 450 children compared to uh, close to a million adults who have died from uh, COVID. But who wouldn't want to save 450 children if we could? And for kids under the age of one, COVID is the number four cause of death over the last two years. For kids between ages one and four, it's the number five cause of death. So this isn't something you should write off as, you know, not a deal at all. Now, we know it's really rare for kids to die from anything. And so that doesn't mean that this is happening frequently, but it just means it's not insignificant. That was Dr. Cameron Webb, who is on the White House COVID response team. I asked him why there was such a lag between the rollout of vaccines for other populations versus the youngins. As a parent, it's really important to me that I know that FDA's process and CDC's process were thorough and complete, right? They didn't cut any corners. Anything they're going to put into my kids has been deeply and thoroughly evaluated in terms of its safety and its efficacy. And so I wouldn't say it took too long. I would say it took exactly the right amount of time, you know, to go through all the data that they have. Now, two options are available for those aged six months through four years, both using smaller doses than the adult version. Pfizer regimen consists of three doses, roughly spread out over three months, and then Moderna, that is a course of two shots with four weeks between them. Esperanza Health Centers operates on the city's southwest side, and it received its allotment of the vaccine just this morning and plans to offer them to patients by the week's end. They're going to have a clinic for three- and four-year-olds, but Younger than that, it's going to require an appointment. Many kids fell behind on routine childhood immunizations, and we did a lot of work um, over the past you know, year, year and a half as, as things started to open up more to get as many of those kids back in for vaccines that they may have missed. But we also feel like this is an opportunity um, if they are coming in for a COVID vaccine, we can check their other vaccines. We can look at sort of developmental things that are going on. This is an opportunity to kind of do some other well care for, for infants and toddlers that maybe was missed during the pandemic. And he hopes that families do make those appointments and visit the clinic. He fears they may not, that as things get back to more quote unquote normal, many families will think that COVID's behind us. My fear is that people will decide not to vaccinate um, because they think it's no longer a public health crisis. Um, and that's the message we really do want to get out to people is that we, while things are better, rates are lower, hospitalizations are lower, that is much to do because of the vaccination efforts that have happened already. And he says that preventing further surges, that is going to mean getting those young children vaccinated too. He says if parents have questions, don't talk to your friends or your neighbors or your family call the doctor. Esperanza, by the way, it takes care of anybody regardless of insurance or ability to pay. And the city of Chicago is planning free clinics too. With that, back to you. All right, vital information there, Amanda. Thanks very much. And now to Brandis for a check-in with a local animal shelter that is celebrating a milestone. Brandis. Paris, thank you. If you have a pet at home, you might have gotten it from one of the city's biggest no-kill pet shelters. For 25 years, Paws Chicago has been saving the lives of animals in Chicago, becoming a leader in the humane treatment of homeless pets and establishing a well-renowned animal hospital. <laughs> 
Joining us now to talk about the organization is its founder, Paula Faseas. She also serves as the executive chair of PAW Chicago. Paula, congrats on 25 years, and thank you for joining us. Tell us what led you to start this organization. Thank you for having me. This is an exciting year for us, 25 years. Uh, well, 25 years ago, my daughter was volunteering at a humane society in Chicago. And after the third cat she brought home, because she said so many were being killed, I said, boy, let us let me go down and talk to these people and see what's happening. And I found out that, um, sadly enough, the majority of animals entering shelters were being euthanized, but the public wasn't being told because they didn't want, you know, it to interfere with their fundraising and what have you. And um, it just disturbed me so much. My daughter was upset. She kept saying, mom, if you love animals, you got to do something. So I researched and I uh, went to Animal Care and Control and I met the folks down there and found out that basically they were euthanizing 93% of the animals every year at Chicago Animal Care and Control, which is different from the humane societies that were also euthanizing. And um, that amounted to 27,000 a year just at Animal Control out of 29,000 and total in Chicago was 42,000 a year back when we started. So what really needed to happen was to get the public engaged and to let them know. So we did an event on Michigan Avenue and Oak Street. We brought animals there and we, the media came out and we said, this is what's happening. And um, things started to change. We basically got the community engaged and, and to help solve the problem. And it started with those three cats that your daughter brought home, it sounds like. Um, you started with a mission, as you say, to stop kill shelters from euthanizing so many homeless animals. Um, you just said and it ended up being an estimated 42,000 pets per year at the time. Um, how many animals would you say are euthanized annually today? Well, we've gone from euthanizing 93% to saving 90% in Chicago. So it's a huge transformation. And what we found really realized at the time was that it is adoption is critical and wonderful for those animals that are living, but you can't stop the inflow. And basically the veterinarians at Animal Care and Control said, if you don't stop the animals coming in, there's nothing, you know, we're not gonna find homes for them all. So the first thing Paul Chicago did was start and open the high volume spay neuter clinic, the Lurie Clinic in Little Village. And when we looked at the data, we realized that it was the underserved communities where it's very costly, where a lot of the unwanted animals were coming from. So we opened in Little Village, the Lurie Spay Neuter Clinic. And this year we will have completed um, our 300,000th spay neuter surgery. That's, that's quite a lot of spay and neuter surgeries, and I mm -hmm. imagine it, it's had a big impact on uh, preventing uh, having more and more animals who are uh, homeless. Well, the, the, actually the data shows that 60% of the reduction has come from less animals entering the shelter. So the fact that we do them free, they're all subsidized, mostly free, and uh, really you know, working with communities that are under-resourced that need our support. Uh, during the pandemic, of course, we saw a lot of people adopt pets uh, as they were, you know, working home alone uh, to the pet to the point that the shelters were almost empty at that time. Um, but since then, we've seen uh, a lot of surrenders happening, uh, some of them for, for different reasons. How has the mm -hmm. pandemic impacted the work of PAWS? Well, I think obviously we had to uh, pivot and change all the ways we operated but we were able to successfully continue and keep our clinic open, which is amazing. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we were the only, the only shelters in the country that kept our spay neuter program going. Um, so we have found that a lot of people are basically right now, because of financial problems, going back to work, they are relinquishing animals more. And we are finding a lot more abandoned animals in Chicago on the streets. Beyond that, what are some of the, the, the problems that homeless animals face today and that organizations like yours face in sort of moderating the, the homeless pet population? I think it's basically spay and neuter and getting the large dogs. I, we've made great progress with small dogs. We still have a cat problem and we have a large dog problem. So at our Lurie Clinic, we are, tar we are really focusing on um, our, the large dogs, which you know take a lot more time to spay and neuter but at the end of the day, that's really when you go to animal care and control, what you're seeing is a large dog problem in Chicago. So we are going to be focusing on that, growing our spay neuter program and hopefully sustaining it with um, the work we do. Um, what would you say is next for, for PAWS and the, the future of animal shelters across the country? 
Well, I would say we opened a big hospital and we're one of the only ones in the country. It's a comprehensive medical center and uh, we have seven full-time veterinarians. So when, as a no-kill shelter, when animals come to us, whatever they need, we will do to make sure that they can get rehomed and not be euthanized. And uh, I think that's kind of what will start happening around the country more. We have a fabulous shelter medicine program and we wanna continue to grow that. We wanna continue to be able to take animals, not only from Chicago, but Illinois rural areas that are, you know, have no resources at all. And we wanna to continue to grow those programs. And again, spay, neuter, spay, neuter, spay, neuter and endow it so that it's always gonna be here for Chicago. Our community has been so responsive to us and we are so grateful and to keep that engagement. You know, as we're watching the video that you all shared with us of the animals, I'm resisting the urge to want to adopt a new pet because my hands are full. But congrats to you, Paula, on your 25 years uh, at Paws, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Up next, a colorful new book by a local artist showcases influential icons of the arts in the LGBTQ community. But first, a look at the weather. From Swan Lake to Frankenstein movies to the pop charts, the arts have always been deeply influenced by artists from the LGBTQ community. An about to be released book shines a light on 50 pioneering artists from around the world who made indelible contributions to culture. Producer Mark Vitale spoke with one of the book's creators who is himself something of a local arts icon. Russia doesn't acknowledge that Tchaikovsky was gay. A new book recognizes the composer of Swan Lake for his artistry and for a part of his personal life that has been redacted from some biographies. All of these people did so much to enrich our daily culture that we, we, hear, we hear or see all the time. And a lot of people in the book are people that may have fallen out of the spotlight that we wanted to acknowledge and tell young people about them. The record companies wanted to portray her as this girly girl, and she said no, she just wore what she wanted. We met artist David Lee Sisko, who, with writer Owen Keenan, made the book to honor late arts icons, including some last-minute additions. Owen and I had a conversation in this bookstore back in February a year ago. We were looking at the publications that were out there, and I said, you know, I think we could do a much better job and make a really lively, fun book that celebrates the history of the LGBTQ community in the arts. And so the book sort of came out as a project that the two of us thought wouldn't be cool to do this book. Cisco's work is all over town, from the mosaics at the Belmont L station, to stained glass windows in Lori Children's Hospital, to tote bags for local businesses and nonprofits, including Lyric Opera and our sister station, WFMT. So it starts out as sketches, and then I scan the sketch with my iPhone to my computer, and then I build it from there. I look for wonderful pictures of the subject. Uh, in the case of uh, Radcliffe Hall, who wrote the first acknowledged lesbian novel, which has a terrible title, The Will of Loneliness. But there, there were pictures of her and her partner with their champion dachshunds in England. And since I have a dachshund, I was thrilled to find that picture, so I drew her with a dachshund. James Whale, the director of Frankenstein, was drawn with an electrode on his neck. Frida Kahlo got a little mustache on her lip. From Frida to Freddie Mercury, the makers of the book had a tough editing process. We looked back and made a list of our favorites, and then we basically arm wrestled as to who got into the book. But we really wanted to be representative of the community at large, even though all of these people have passed away. But we really wanted to celebrate them. Celebratory or not, the book is being published in a challenging political climate. Sooner or later, everything becomes political, and especially in the time we live in now, where certain politics are trying to erase certain things or take freedoms away from various groups. And the fact that we made this as a book for young people, and now that's being challenged in uh, public education in Florida. We're really lucky to live where we live, where we can bring things forward and bring them to the table. And hopefully this book is a wonderful book for young people and their parents and their relatives and their friends to create discussion and, 
and just make people feel good. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. Cool illustrations there. The book LGBTQ Icons was scheduled to be published this month, but supply chain issues have pushed the publication date back to July 12th. You can find out more on our website. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Alderman Michael Scott's sister faces a vote to take over her brother's city council seat. And how a homeless shelter in Humboldt Park is offering LGBTQ youth a safe place to live. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a proud sponsor of diversity, equity, and inclusion-focused free continuing legal education for lawyers throughout the region.